Hey, it's Thursday. It's snowing like heck. Don't worry. Uh, we'll distract you. Tim is here for a good conversation. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. That would be Tim White if you're scoring at home. And by the way, he's scoring the football game. I'll, yeah, he, He's watched it a couple of times. I didn't realize what kind of avid Patriot fan we have here. Uh, things you find out about uh, our top journalists from time to time. Great to have you in. Now listen, program note, I don't know, because it's New England, because it's Rhode Island, because we're afraid of snowstorms and all that kind of thing, we taped this show that you're seeing on snowy Thursday night uh, yesterday for reasons that you don't have to deal with, but generally you're expecting on Thursday night for me to say something about what's going on in the world. You know, Donald Trump takes out a judge, whatever, uh, unable to react to that, but it's actually a benefit because uh, Tim was scheduled for the Wednesday show. We're making it the Thursday show. It gives us a chance to talk about some things, and when he and I get together, uh, there's never enough time anyway. So having said that, the premise for the invitation for Mr. White to the program was to highlight a... Uh, Target 12 piece or two that he has done on the former Speaker of the House who's pushing brooms and making meals at a federal penitentiary somewhere in the hills of Pennsylvania. Here are some of the headlines that ought to remind you of the story. Uh, former inmate describes Gordon Fox's life in prison. Well, that's the actual Target 12 piece that we've uh, recently heard. It all stems from this at the beginning where the House Speaker uh, weeping on the stairs was sent away. Uh, here is an excerpt of the key witness, if you will, for the story, the storyteller. This is the inmate friend, associate, co-bunk guy, I don't know, um, at the federal pen. Gordon has been punished. Gordon was disbarred. He lost his livelihood. Uh, he's been embarrassed. His family's been embarrassed. He will never again be looked at in the same way. And he's a good guy. He's a good guy. That's Stanley Cohen, who is the, what, the foil uh, Former for, for, this, for this package, which is, uh, I think, uh, fascinating. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you, Dan. And by uh, the way, I'm not just a big Patriots fan. I'm an unhealthy Patriots fan. Meaning? Uh, I snack on my nails while I'm watching the games. You know, I'm one of those. Your, your Giants ruined me in 07. Mm. After that, I just, it's, it's unhealthy. And I admit it, you know, it's the first, you know, I own it. Um, and Sunday. Tell everybody how many times you've seen the game. Three times. I've watched it three times. I like to break down game film. And I'm an analytical it, guy. In its totality. Okay. DVR. Just you see, you ask good questions. I uh, I skip the first quarter of the rewatches, so I pick it up right before the second half, and then I. What do you do? You kind of relive how you thought about what was going on. I look for things I didn't. Uh, I didn't look for before linebacker play, or you know where, uh, you know where the running back, if they were using a blocking play, was Martellus Bennett uh, tight end? Was he in the pass play? Was he uh, blocking? Things like that. I like to pick up. I think it's a smart game, and every time I watch a game, I learn something. So from you have it. a Belichick approach to fandom, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Uh, look, I'm not proud of it. You know, well, but I don't think you should be embarrassed by it. I think it's just a unique. Uh, we all have our hobbies. Uh, yeah, no, mine. really, because you got nothing else to do. It's not like you're, you know, chasing <laughs> stories and well, working hard. Well, fortunately, my kids kind of they like to watch it with me, so that's good stuff. It is. It's a lot of fun. It really is. It's good they, to be a Patriots and, fan. And too. I'm freewheeling here, so I'm happy to talk about the Patriots. I don't know how long this ride's going to go, but this notion of we want six is natural, but almost laughable. It's, I have told my kids they're 10 and 8. I said, you don't. I grew up a uh, Boston sports fan. Uh, I watched the ball go through Buckner's legs. I saw the Patriots get destroyed by the Bears in 1986. Um, and I tell them, this is not how it's always going to be. I saw this great uh, this kid at the parade the other day holding a sign that said, I'm 15, and I've been to 10 parades. <laughs> Isn't that spectacular? And it's... That is not my childhood. No. That is not my childhood. So I tell them, I agree with you. I don't know how long it's going to go on. Knock on wood, it goes on for a long time. Well, you know, Brady, the, the, they're talking about three to five year extensions here and, and everything else at, at some juncture. Uh, look, you, who knows? Maybe he does know. play till 42. You know, maybe you do get three more rings. Maybe maybe it just just never stops. I, I, I have no idea. But... Uh, the poor guy that's going to have to be the full-time quarterback after Tom Brady finally says, "Uncle, yeah, he's going to have one significant 
pressure cooker career ahead of him. I agree. Those are big shoes to fill, to put it m mildly. And who knows? Maybe it'll be Jimmy Garoppolo. We'll see. All right. Let's, so, let's, sorry. Let's talk about Gordon Fox. When we Fox. come back, we will. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, so Gordon Fox, once upon a time, was the Speaker of the House. And now he's, uh, I wouldn't say rotting away, but he's sitting in the federal penitentiary and is due out, what, uh, the due date is kind of February of 18 when you do the calculations? Valentine's Day, 2018. A year from now. That's right. That is if he uh, is a model inmate at Canaan Federal Prison in uh, Western Hills of Pennsylvania. Well, based on your reporting, seems like he is. Yeah. And I don't think that should surprise. I mean, whatever no. people uh, think of Gordon Fox, when you interact with him, he's, he was always a nice guy, he, gentleman. I don't see him having any prison infractions where no. it's going to prevent him from earning that, that good time that they calculate. 13% of your sentence, so that's about 54 days a year. You get off your sentence if, if you're a model inmate. Mm -hmm. Remind everybody why he's in. He is in uh, for a bribery and fraud case. He accepted a, admitted to accepting a $52,500 bribe, not as a lawmaker, but when he was a vice chair of the Providence Board of Licenses. And the fraud case is when you boil it down for uh, using his own campaign funds for personal gain. And a lot of people might remember that in the wake of that, uh, the General Assembly rewrote their reporting laws in terms of how they're supposed to report their campaign funds. Right. Reminder, he didn't go away for 38 studios, and we'll no. talk about that a little bit later on. A lot of people who don't pay attention think that there's a connection there. There's absolutely no relationship um, to 38 studios. Discussion coming up. So you decided to go find out what the speaker's doing in, in, in jail. You didn't get much access to the, uh, to the facility, but you did get access to a guy that hung out with him for a while. Right. So I've written Gordon Fox in prison. Uh, I've talked to his lawyer, former House Speaker Bill Murphy, requested interviews multiple times. So we haven't gotten that yet. We figured the next be best thing is to find somebody that served time with him. That was not easy to do, but we eventually uh, tracked down a guy named Stanley Cohen, who you heard his voice at the top of your show, and he is a he's a controversial guy himself, a lawyer uh, who got who represented clients like the uh, the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He's represented Hamas leaders. He went away for 11 months for evading the IRS. Those. The, his time there overlapped for, uh, when Gordon Fox first walked into Canaan Prison in July of 2015. So they served about six months together, and according to him, you know, they, they talked a lot, they became fairly close. Gordon Fox took uh, Stanley Cohen's law classes, in, including constitutional law, uh, and he said, you know, they, they talked. So I wanted to know what Gordon Fox's life is like, but also what the, the prison is like. Is it Hardcore is a club fed. What, what were we looking at? And this was the, you know, we could see the prison through the prism of this guy, Stanley Cohen. Closer to club fed, I mean, yeah. uh, than it is hardcore. Yeah, I mean, and Bill Murphy box at that when I interviewed him for the for the piece, uh, for the online piece. Uh, he said, look, prison is prison. It's it's not easy. And sure, you're ripping Bill away. Murphy, the former House Speaker, Gordon Fox's lawyer. And I, yes, and I context on that. He's gone to visit Gordon Fox uh, several times, uh, as has Gordon's husband, Marcus LaFond. And, you know, Bill's point, well taken, wherever you're housed, you're ripped away from your family, from your s surroundings, whatever. Uh, but it is not a hardcore prison. There are no bars. There are no cells. There are, it's a camp. There are bunk beds. It's a warehouse-like facility. You could literally walk out of it. Um, it, it, these are not for har hardcore inmates. Stanley Cohen's point is you'd be an idiot if you walked out of the camp because as soon as you do that and eventually get caught, you're going to go to the hardcore prison. You're going to have a cell. You're going to have bars. You're going to be mixed in with murderers and drug king kingpins and, and so on and so forth. So its security is, you know, the, the inmates' willingness to stay there. Comparability to, say, Buddy Cianci, got rest of his soul, so Fort stay Dix. in Fort Dix. A yep. little bit more um, typical jail scene there for Cianci. Yeah, I think where uh, the way it had been described where Cianci was, that's Fort Dix is more of a prison prison, but uh, he did have a shared space with bunk beds and, and so on and so forth, so it wasn't one person per cell. Those are usually reserved for the, the folks that really have to lock down. But I, I get your point, and it's a valid one. Where Gordon Fox is staying, uh, 
doesn't have the harshness it feels like to where Buddy CNC uh, was housed. So what's the moral of the story? He's going to get out probably for a halfway house in six months. Yeah, he's getting out sooner than people think. And I mean, it's probably no moral of the story. It's really a, it's just kind of a status check as to how the speaker is doing out there, the former speaker. Um, I don't, I don't have any. You should go, by the way, to uh, foxprovidence.com or wpri.com and see the Target 12 piece and get a perspective on all of this. The idea that uh, Gordon Fox is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a prisoner who behaves, a guy who's not ruffling any feathers, is perfectly predictable. I think, he, you know, despite his foibles, easy guy to get along with, uh, friendly, amenable guy, not the kind of guy that I think would. Um, be rabble rousing. So, and and on, in some ways, and even on the courthouse steps as he left, you know, he's got a significant dose of humility. I mean, he he kind of wore his pain on his sleeve as he went to jail. He was an emotional guy. Yeah. You, I, you know, you've talked to him, uh, and one of the most memorable newsmakers I ever did was with Gordon Fox, uh, where he was not honest with myself or Ted Nisi during that show, as we now know. Uh, but he, he, as you say, he wore his emotions uh, on his sleeve. And Stanley Cohen, you know, who is no fan of the government, <laughs> no fan of incarceration, and certainly no fan of, of halfway houses, was trying to, in the piece, send the message to, to people here to try and to, to forgive uh, Gordon Fox and that he has expressed remorse inside prison, that he felt that he let uh, Rhode Island down, and that Gordon Fox a lot of people were very upset at the three-year sentence that Gordon Fox got. Um, and uh, Stanley Cohen's point is, look, he, he, has, he has paid his debt to society, is paying his debt to society. Upset which way? That it wasn't enough? Yeah, that it wasn't enough. I mean, that's the reaction that, and I'm sure you did on your radio show, people gave you. That's certainly the reaction that we got as well, that what, what kind of message does three years send when you're, you're uh, violating the public's trust? Uh, and Cohen's point is it's beyond just the three-year sentence. He's humiliated, uh, ruined for life, disbarred. His life will never be the same. So there's more than just the time you spend in the, in the walls of that building. Yeah, it's fascinating a story as that might be what happens to Gordon Fox when he comes back. That's to be determined. Uh, but again, I remind you, he's not there for 38 studios, but that story is still lingering. We'll talk to Tim about it when we come back. Stay with us. We talk about appointing an independent investigator, and I did say that, and I have changed. Um, a few thoughts on that. That's not cheap. You know, that's minimum two million bucks. And if I really thought that that would bring about new information, I would do it. You say, you know, having the speaker or JCLS do this. Do you think people will think that's independent? I mean, he was in leadership at the time that this happened. All right, so that's a little bit of a mix uh, of audio from a conversation I had with Governor Raimondo Monday in her office for the purposes of the radio show, weekdays 3 to 6 on WPRO. She's uh, due to come in here uh, shortly, I hope, to elaborate on this. But nobody knows 38 Studios better than Tim White. Um, and it is Tim White's question, actually, to Governor Raimondo that lingers as her, I think, biggest political hangover, and that is a response of the word yes to a question, will you call for an independent investigation of 38 Studios in the gubernatorial debate that mm -hmm. you hosted uh, prior to her winning election? Um, and it's a flip-flop. I mean, it, it, it's she's admitted to that. flop Yeah, yes. absolutely. No question about it. Um, and and I, I do think that can be a, a political anchor around her neck. I don't know if it's the biggest, but, um, you know, it certainly is one. 38 Studios is like that, that in-law that won't leave Thanksgiving dinner. It's just always, they're always around, and it keeps coming back up again. And um, I think it's one of those things that sh she'd rather not have to deal with. Um, you know, and people can make what they want of her answer to you as, as to why, as to whether the cost would be prohibitive, if the civil case uh, is enough, see that play out, and the release, she, you know, she is calling for the release of, of the investigatory materials from the criminal investigation. Uh, will that provide enough, enough transparency to appease people? Yeah, I, I doubt it. Uh, and it's kind of I don't know anyone's ever going to be appeased on 38 Yeah, so well, look, someone's I, in handcuffs. Someone the, goes to prison. I think that would be the only time. Well, yes, yes, and it's one of those uh, hard to argue things. I have said to her, and I think this concept of somebody going away in handcuffs 
is a misnomer for the objective in this. Um, this, this is such a complicated conversation, but one of the things, and it's gone on so long that it's become this like lingering, you know, just stenchy sickness over the state's reputation, political community, and economy. I think, and if you listen to us into that, that interview, go to 630wpr.com or follow me on Twitter and Facebook and listen to what the governor said. Later, she finally has this like light bulb go off in her head about what I have been saying about the purposefulness of an independent investigation, that she should spend that $2 million, if that's what she estimates it's going to be. I don't think it'll be that much. Uh, she's got this kind of Watergate hearing mindset in her head. Uh, I think what will happen after this some discussion and decision by the courts as to whether the grand jury and state police stuff can come out. And then after you call through it and you report on it and all that kind of thing. I think there will be a reason for her to understand that still yet, no one has done, for lack of a better term, the Cliff's Notes on this thing from a governmental or outside agency point of view. Mm -hmm. A lot of people relied on your excellent reporting on this, and for some that's enough. The thing that is problematic about the concept of the independent investigation is that there's too much fixation, I think, on someone's got to go away. What really needs to be done is from an outside agency point of view is to actually describe what happened, chips fall where they may candor about, about the whole thing, and then name names and accountability in terms of political irresponsibility and systemic irresponsibility and then set a course for the future. But an outside agency saying, look, it's now buttoned up and done, I think at least will put it on the shelf for people. Do you think, I mean, uh, in, uh, just to play... And that affects the economy. I'm more, I'm good, because she will admit to me that... that Every time she's out there hustling, and I don't like brand. her economic program, but she works hard at it. Yes. She admits how badly it hurts her brand, yes. that no conversation she has with outside economic investors, companies, goes without a discussion of 38 Studios. And that ought to be the light off in her head that says, I have to be responsible to do the best I can to put that baby away. Well, that, and, you know, she has talked about, she's in California meeting with PayPal, all the phones go off. And one of the uh, people in the room says, hey, did your House Finance Chairman, is he under federal investigation, referring to Ray Gallus and that broke? So, yeah, she's had branding problems on both sides. I'm devil's advocate on, on why <laughs> not doing the independent investigation um, from a, maybe from a communication standpoint, a PR. Uh, that just breathes new life into 38 studios for them. And I think they're maybe speculating, hoping that at some point it'll just, it'll stop. You know, it, it released the grand jury materials. Here's how it'll never stop. Your wish is not going to come true. Because while my phones don't ring about 38 Studios on the radio anymore, nobody says to me, hey, Dan, what's going on with 38 Studios? Here's how 38 Studios will impact everything going forward forevermore. McCoy Stadium comes up as a private public partnership project. The Superman building comes up as a private partner. Pop, pop, say that three times fast. Um, Projects that require cooperative spending between public That's and private partnerships. That's going to happen whether you have are, an independent investigation or not. No, but what, but what you have is a constant fail-safe complaint, critique, that it's another 38 studios. You've got to do that. And by the way, it's gone so long, and they've screwed it up so badly, that you may never get the kind of closure that even I think an independent review would do. I totally agree but with that. But you've got, it's never, it's not like 38's going to come up all the time unless it's comparative to all the other growth projects that very, very well may be legitimate and in the pipeline. It is a lingering, lingering problem for this state. And the idea that you bring more attention to it by finally having the kind of reporting on it that's necessary is the eventual pain that has to be purged in order to be able to do the best effort to put it aside and be done with it. And I, I do not want people to walk, uh, come away from this conversation thinking, I don't want an independent investigation. I was just offering another perspective no, because the uh, sunlight yeah. is the best well, disinfectant. You, you well, you hope that, that you know, uh, 
that the further it's in the rearview mirror, the further it's away, and it finally dissipates and goes away. Not in this place. Not in a place where snowstorms are still referred back to, you know, the, the 70s. Yeah. Not, 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 <laughs> yeah. not, not in this place. Yeah. Nobody forgets anything in this place. Yeah, we have steel traps, for sure. It's a small sandbox, and people yeah. remember. In yeah. the meantime, the, new, the, 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 the dynamics between the state attorney general and the oh. state police are fascinating. He can explain it to you when we come back. Stay with us. Fascinating development uh, last week where Peter Kim Martin, the Attorney General right there, uh, issued a press release um, kind of complaining about the state police not investing resources and in continuing the investigation. And the state police new colonel, Anna Sumpico, saying, hey, wait a second, he knows that if we had something new, we'd reopen it, but we don't, and so we're not. And by the way, the investigation criminally ended a year and a half ago. Uh, the grand jury may have, but right. the state police certainly didn't. And of course, we had that whole big, what are you doing last July when the former state, state police colonel, Steve O'Donnell, and the AG had this press release, uh, press conference, press conference on a Friday on a, in late July. on a Friday afternoon. And everyone was going, and they were like, well, we just finished. So there's a lot of confusion and now going on. What do you think is going on? Well, first of all, it feeds into that perception that something's going on in the background to even right or wrong that we talked about in the last segment. People don't feel good about how that played out, how the announcement of no charges, that there were no charges. It is bizarre that the attorney general sent out that press release um, on a Friday, again, criticizing the investigatory arm that he works with the Rhode Island State Police, which, by the way, has a new colonel, Anna Sumpico. Uh, and, you know, I've had people ask me, do you think he would have done that if it were Steve O'Donnell? Um, only uh, Peter Kilmartin knows the answer to that. But, of course, the dynamic could have been different. Maybe Steve O'Donnell would had, have had a different approach than Anna Sumpico did. But to have this public spat uh, over this issue is like watching a car accident in slow motion. And I think it damages well, certainly damages the relationship between the two organizations. I can tell you that there are people that work for the state police that are just not happy about how that uh, played out with the uh, attorney general's office. And that is, that when you work that closely together, that is not, look, you can have disagreements with people you work with um, all the time, but to have it play out in public like that is, uh, is wild. Yeah, which only feeds the, the couple beasts here. Uh, again, people's angst over whether there's something that they're fighting in the back behind the scenes over. Chris Kilmartin was uh, not in leadership, but was a voting member. Oh, of Peter Kilmartin. I mean, yeah, what I say? Chris. I mean, I'm losing my mind. Uh, <laughs> Peter Kilmartin, the Attorney General, was a voting member of the legislature, authorizing the uh, loan guarantee program. They brought you 38 Studios. Right. He had moved from leadership just prior. Um, you know, is he protecting the boys? Uh, Anna Sumpico, is she investigatively um, on, on her game because that's not her background? So there's a lot of worry about that. And then Kill Martin's floating this idea that he might run for governor out there in the streets. So that's. Is uh, he going to primary Governor yeah. Raimondo? And he's, you know, uh, we haven't run a poll, but I'd be interested to see the results. Here you have Governor Raimondo saying, I'm on the side of transparency, release the documents, right. and Kill Martin on the other side. Fascinating. Anything that goes on with 38 Studios, make sure you're checking Target 12 and uh, see that Gordon Fox report. It is fascinating. And uh, enjoy your fourth review of the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Final word. Already uh, coming up on the program tomorrow, till, to be determined, because, you know, it was snowing today, and we're still trying to figure out uh, who can dig out and who can who had enough bread and milk to survive the Thursday of snow. Right, Lex? So just hang in there with us. It's a snowy week in February. Uh, thanks for watching, and be listening at 3 till 6 on WPRO. Right.